two weeks ago, we tried to talk about space and we got uh, sidetracked by talking about customer service. Ovens. We're going to continue to talk about space, but let's get sidetracked really quick and talk about the resolution to the customer service and your ovens. Deb, go. Okay, so if everybody remembers without telling the whole story, ordered the ovens, paid for the ovens, they said I didn't pay. Waited two weeks to get the oven, never got the oven because they said I didn't pay. Correct. Then I paid again, only to find out that I did pay, so now I paid twice. Double pay. In the meantime, before I bought the oven the second time, yes. the salesman said, hey, it went down 10%. Good to know. Great. I got a better price. Tack it on. Tack it on. So... There were just all sorts of issues. I feel like I managed this with dozens of phone calls. And then again, I think I expressed my love for the guys who put the oven in, but they were an hour and 45 minutes late. Got it. Okay. So I say to the woman who has not apologized, who has not acknowledged that anything was gone has gone wrong. Which at this point we believe is 1000% company policy to just not take ownership over a mistake. 100%. And is kind of indifferent. And for a while, when I was insisting that I paid, kind of was like, did you? You know, right. like that. So I very kindly said to her, not in a Karen kind of way, I said, hey, I think I deserve an extra 10% off because I've spent way too much time managing this process. You guys have dropped the ball a lot. You kind of made me feel like I was lying when I said I paid and I didn't. Nobody would investigate that mistake. I finally found it. I want 10% off. She goes, we gave you 10% off. And, and you I go, said, I don't think so. I don't think so. Cause it was already marked down. And if I would have come in on that day and bought it, that's the price I would have paid. So don't try to talk the markdown of 10% into the, we screwed up and love you. Right. 10%, totally. Right. And so she goes, well, I'm just going to have to get back to you. So she did. And guess what? Ding, ding, ding. They gave me the 10%. So that's a fifth off. I saved an additional, in total, my two 10% ended up being close to $600. Is it worth what you had to go through? Well, since the, no. No, I was happy with the price in the first place. So no. And that is Deb's customer service resolu <laughs> resolution corner. Deb, let's talk about space. Okay, because I know nothing. That's fair. I know nothing either, but I'm wearing a NASA sweatshirt, so I pretty much am a physicist. Okay. Mars rover landed two weeks ago. SpaceX shuttle successfully unmanned landed. Then it blew up, but but it landed. And immediately blew up, well, right? Well, like 10, 15 seconds. Okay. You and saw... that feels like immediately to me. You saw the space landing on television, not in person. I don't think you were on the moon. In 1969. Oh, okay. So you you're, would have been like four. You're talking about the moon landing. That's what I said, moon landing. Okay, you said space landing. Yeah, space landing, moon landing, it's the same thing. You <laughs> saw the moon landing, the moon is in space in 1969. Do you remember thinking this is a phenomenal moment for mankind? Well, I think that's, didn't Neil Armstrong say something like that? Well, I didn't say that it wasn't imposed by some outside <laughs> force. Do you remember thinking that? Uh, well, I probably did think it because, in fact, he said it. But I do have a very clear recollection of him walking down, you know, in his spacesuit. Yep. The, like a ladder. I do remember the spaceman being in his spacesuit. The spaceman in his spacesuit and uh, walking down the ladder and didn't he like, did he hit a golf ball, throw a golf ball? He did something like that. I don't think he threw a golf ball. No? That's just what we do on the weekends when we're really <laughs> upset. I do believe he hit a golf ball. Yeah, he hit a golf ball. And then they planted the flag that looked planted plastic. The flag. Okay, so these are my highlight reels in my memory. Go for it. The golf ball. Got it. The walking down the stairs, the Got stair it. ladder thing. Yep. And the flag. I've got that firmly burned in my memory. That's it. Did you, I mean... Because it was back, I mean, because we're just figuring. Because it was in the olden days. Because it was in the olden days <laughs> and you're literally watching something happen in space. Did you have to hunker down for like 20 hours to watch this thing? Or did they pretty much give you a window, you the proverbial audience, a window of like an hour? Oh, I think we had a, like we had an hour. Yeah. Got no, it. I mean, I, the, I don't remember that specifically, but I wouldn't have hunkered down for 20 hours. That's crazy. 
Well, I don't know. You guys didn't have anything to do back then. (laughs) We'd probably, you know, play ball outside in a stick and wheel game. I don't know. So now fast forward 10 years since then, right? (laughs) Fast forward to today and you see things like us sending unmanned rovers to Mars and the sequence it takes from it to go from outer space into the Mars orbit to drop a rover is something out of a Ridley Scott movie. Are you enamored with the idea that we've come so far? Does it resonate with you or are you like, space is cool. Don't get it. Happy that things go well. Okay. So a little bit of of me is space is cool. Don't get it. Happy things went well. Yeah. Because when things haven't gone well, it's very upsetting whether you're into space stuff or not. Did you watch the shuttle thing blow up with the teacher in it? Yes. For those of you, so again, we are not space people. We don't know anything about the space stuff. And we don't watch all of that. And so if you are into it, a thousand apologies for butchering this, but there was a a teacher, like a random teacher, right? Who was picked to go on a NASA mission to space and the thing blew up on the launch pad. McAuliffe, something McAuliffe. I don't know. I think so. Yeah. Was that just horrific? It was horrific because, you know, we always look at astronauts as if those people were born and groomed to do that, yep. which is not true, but that's what it feels like, yep. right? And so astronauts are just these special groups of people. You know, like when kids are little, you say, do you want to be president? Do you want to yep. be an astronaut, right? And oftentimes astronauts come from a military background, so they know the dangers of this profession. Right. And so all of a sudden, you know, a teacher qualified to do it. I mean, that just felt crazy, like a regular person, right? Mm-hmm. And so she got all sorts of, you know, PR before. Totally. And I mean, somehow, I mean, they're all normal people, right? But she looked like just such a normal person. I remember her having brown hair, like in a perm. Kind of curly. Yeah. yeah to hear. Yeah. And I mean, I think she had, I mean, she had a good smile. I mean, she, it was, it was terrific, right? I mean, it's also the fact that she was a teacher, teacher, which just in and of itself is like wholesome, cares about kids. And now she gets this opportunity to represent this kind of um, unspoken for demographic of people who help one another. And can you even imagine all her whole school watching and everything? I think I, I want to say that <sighs> like every school was on pause for that moment to watch it. And yeah. then arguably the worst thing in the world happened. It exploded on live television. And then the other part of it that this, this stuff, this is the stuff that I think about that kind of makes me sad. There were astronauts on there that had trained their whole lives for that, that mission, yep. that moment. Right. And it's, I mean, she didn't do anything wrong, like take the attention from them, but I don't know if a lot of people could even name those other astronauts. No. I mean, to be fair, I can't name the woman. Well, I mean, I think her name was, was it like Krista McAuliffe or something? Yeah, like that? for sure. You don't know. Look it up while we're talking. Stacy Barber, I think her okay, name was. That wasn't her name. Angela but Rayburn. That wasn't her name. Got it. So, and I could be wrong too. That's why I would like. Yeah, you it's to probably look it up. Jessica oh Lemonsworth. God, stop it. Okay. But when something like that happens, you know, I always think like if it were somebody I knew and cared about, I want. I want them to be remembered. And what we remember is that a teacher was on that flight. Okay. Do you know what I mean? Pivot from death. Yes. So focusing back on the idea that you saw kind of our introduction into space, we are now sending rovers to Mars. We're sending helicopters to Mars. We have missions planned to eventually send people to the moon to help colonize it, to eventually send people to Mars to colonize it with new groups showing up every 26 months to help expand the colony. If younger Deb had the wherewithal and the requirements to go colonize the moon or go colonize Mars with no real plan to ever come back, Mm. would you do that or would you just say, hey, I'm just going to go in orbit, stare down at this little blue marble and come back to life? I have no desire to be first people. I want to circle around and come back. So, uh, can I have a couple of questions like a one minute hypothetical? Do you want, wait, you just want me to come up with questions? No, I want to ask you a couple of questions. Oh, sure. Yeah. Okay. So this, wherever I'm going, okay. Wherever they've decided the it's colony two is places, to be. the moon or the Mars. Okay. Moon or Mars. 
Every time I go outside, do I have to wear a spacesuit? Of course, there's no oxygen on okay, those places. Okay, then I'm staying on Earth. Until they build a dome. No, nope, I'm staying on Earth. If, I won't live that long. Do you remember the movie Biodome with Polly Shore? Yes. And yes. Stephen Baldwin? And Set. I can't believe Polly Shore is the first name you said. Shout out Stephen Baldwin. His yeah. daughter married Justin Bieber. They were building a biodome with the idea that you could replicate all of the natural habitats of Earth on something like Mars or the moon. Right. If they could build successfully build a biodome on Mars or the moon, would that change your desire? A little bit. My younger depths, I can never come back. No, you live in the biodome with Polly Shore and Stephen Baldwin. Coming back to earth. But you kind of want to stay with Polly Shore and Stephen Baldwin? Kind of don't. Kinda, okay. That makes me even want to come back to earth even more. It's a great movie. You should watch it. It is <laughs> I have watched it hilarious. several times. Yes. Uh, so no desire. You just... If you were a highly trained, specific astronaut, you would say, guys, I appreciate that you want to send me to a planet and never see me again. I'm just going to do a couple orbits and come home. Well, now you've changed the scenario. Initially, you said, would younger Deb. Right. Well, younger Deb wasn't a highly trained, sophisticated astronaut. Well, clearly, I'm assigning you these attributes so that you could actually qualify to go somewhere and never come back. Okay, so... I don't know. I think it takes a certain kind of person to go and never come back. I would say that you have to simultaneously love humanity to yes. to be yes. a literal like sample right. and experiment yourself yes. while simultaneously hating all of humanity. So you can get away. Exactly. Here's the thing like I think, you know, we, well, I, I'll speak more to myself. I'm a mountain person. I'm a water person. I'm a big sky person. Yeah. Like I like to look up and look out, right? Yeah. Ugh, if all I'm looking at is back at earth on, you know, every third moon or something, that wouldn't be enough for me. What if you could have a pool? What if? <laughs> <laughs> but seriously. But the pool is in the biodome. It's not really outside. But seriously, you should watch or you should go to mars.nasa.gov you should see the renderings of the rover you should see the videos you should see the technology that took it from space into the mars orbit and landed it on the ground it is absolutely freaking nuts and i think they say that all of the technology that we use today and they i mean those blank ominous faces that we refer to as they all of the technology that we use to today are because of the technologies that nasa came up with back in like the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Mm, that's amazing. So if we're using cutting edge Ridley Scott aliens type technology to get us to different planets and different moons, I just hope that we can have like hoverboards here soon. Well, if you're going to bring up hover, hoverboards, then I have to say two things. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Number one, younger Deb believes that older Deb. Yep. We'll be living in a Jetsons age. I think every kid believed they were living in it. We're going to live in a Jetsons age. And one more thing. Younger Deb believes older Deb will be able to Star Trek transport. This has been a grave disappointment for me. I want you to know. You want flying cars, which we're not close to. We're close to autonomous cars, but not close to flying cars. No. And you want to be able to dissolve your molecular structure and have it reanimated somewhere else. Anywhere. I think those are very fair requests from a past Deb to have of you. And because you failed her so miserably, <laughs> would you like to apologize to her? No, I don't want to apologize, but it makes me sad that my analogy about Star Trek and about the Jetsons, I'm trying to somehow link to NASA and SpaceX today. Well, if you thought in the first 15 minutes that we were going to cover customer service, dead teachers the Jetsons, and Deb colonizing the moon, <laughs> you win. Let's start the podcast. Oh my. Welcome to the Deb and Kev podcast. One is a Harvard Business School alum. The other is her son, discussing business, pop culture, family, and everything in between. Now here are your hosts, Deb and Kev. Hey, hi, hello, and welcome to the Deb and Kev podcast. Across from me, looking as radiant and beautiful as ever is my mom, Deb. I'm Deb. 
And I'm in desperate need of a haircut. And so I feel like I look like an extra from the Sopranos or Goodfellas or kind of like my Uncle Walt, RIP. I'm her son, Kev, and this is our podcast. On today's show, Deb found some inspiration in her business segment for today from our Thursday podcast, and she's going to do a deeper dive into the saying, it's just business, baby. (laughs) I added the baby in there. Yeah. We have all new questions for Dear Debbie this week, and we are going to tell you what we are thankful for, and we are going to take a trip to the ocean for dinner this evening. Oh, oh, yes. I'm not, we're not really taking a trip to the ocean. Would be nice though. It would be nice. I would love it. But first, I have a very fun story that I'd like to share with everybody that actually does not involve me, but involves someone that I know. Are you going to tell us who? Would you like to hear it? (laughs) <laughs> yes. Okay. But wait, who who is someone you know? Because I don't want to unintentionally drag this person for this story. We're just going to refer to him as Chris. Wait a minute though. Have you spoken of this person before in the podcast? Deb, I think we've spoken of everybody we've ever known on this podcast. Okay, I'm not sure what the story is. But with the look on your face, I have a feeling it's going to be good. Okay. It's it's great tease. I think it's going to be great. Okay. Like, why don't we just use the person's name? Because let me tell the story first. Okay. All right. Go ahead. So my friend, Chris, Chris. (laughs) (laughs) my friend, Chris, not me, not me, my friend, Chris, he has a couple roommates and during the summer of quarantine, he and one of his roommates decided we're going to go get dogs. They drove over to California and they'd been talking about purchasing dogs for a while. And they both purchased uh, a male and a female from the same litter. Uh, Chris, brother and sister, brother and sister. Chris got the female. The other roommate got the male. Now, if you have any cursory knowledge over dogs, which I do, (laughs) you should know that nobody recommends having dogs from the same litter live together. They're meant to go be by themselves. They're meant to form new relationships. They're meant to join your pack. If you bring two dogs from the same litter together, oftentimes they're codependent. Oftentimes they just rely on one another and they're more difficult to train because they have that forever buddy system. So they're, they're meant to be just like us. Absolutely. Grow up and leave our families and go do our own thing. Yeah, (laughs) totally. Like us grow up, leave your families around 40. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Chris is like hyper vigilant with this dog. Like he refers to himself as a dog dad. He refers to this Mm. dog as his daughter, which I think is super duper weird because in order (laughs) to have a daughter, you have to, you know, go through a certain act. And he didn't do that from what I understand for this dog, but he refers to himself like that. And he's very, very, very protective of her in every single way. So this breed is they're half, um, Great Pyrenees okay, and half, I think Golden Retriever, Golden Lab. Okay. So the Great Pyrenees, they, they would be huge if they were right, purebreds. Right. I mean, they'd be massive. So they're not as big, but they have a beautiful white coat and they kind of have the facial structure of a Golden Retriever. They're beautiful dogs. Very, very beautiful dogs. So they're about nine months old now. And before I get to the meat of the story, a small group of friends and I were going to go get Froyo this past Monday and I'm about two minutes out and on this group chat, Chris says, Hey, my girlfriend and I are going to be a little late. The dogs got stuck together. Now these dogs are together morning, noon, and night. And it is not uncommon for them to like lay all over each other, play with each other. And I envisioned that their collars got stuck when he together. Said stuck together. See, I didn't envision that when you just said that. You're smarter than me. <laughs> So very quickly after we received that text, we get a picture and the picture is of the dogs butt to butt with one another stuck together. If again, you do not have as much dog knowledge as I do, (laughs) you would not know that that is the end result of those two dogs doing doggy business in the form of fornicating. You should have stopped at doggy business. But I just want to make sure like, I, like doggy business sounded like a fun Saturday morning cartoon. And I wanted everybody to understand that those dogs had sex with each other. Okay. okay? All right. 
The thing that makes this even better is I don't expect everybody that know how dogs procreate. I do. But he had... Wait, he, don't tell us something we're going to be uncomfortable with. He had no, oh, no earthly idea what was happening in front of him. He had no clue. Chris didn't? Chris had no <laughs> clue. He was actively trying to separate them from oh, one no. another. No, no, no. I think he thought that somehow something had just got entangled. Oh, no. So... His girlfriend sends a video, this lengthy video of him trying to like solve this Rubik's cube of dog. He had no idea what to do. So then they call their vet and the vet's like, hey, it's after hours. We can't help you. At no point does the vet point out what is actually happening because I think the vet is giving him the benefit of the doubt that he knows what's happening when he right. very much has no idea what's happening. Then he calls the emergency vet and the emergency vet through laughter from what I'm told mm. is telling them there's only one thing to do. And that's for you to wait for them to do their business. And he says, what are you talking about? He, and the vet finally says they just are in the process of mating. Chris and his girlfriend <laughs> and the dog eventually showed up. Mm -hmm. I have never in my life seen somebody so shook to the core about something that didn't affect him. Chris or the, not the dog, Chris. The dog was in a really bad way too, but <laughs> he was absolutely distraught. Mm. Distraught. He wore it. Like I told you at the beginning of the story, he like prided himself on being this great hypervigilant dog father that uh, was obliterated in the span of a minute. Is he, is he shaming her in any way? Like, is he calling her a slut or something? No, say that. <laughs> Kevin, no, no, this has gone no. off the rails. Well, how would, why would he shame his dog? Well, I don't know. Like, is he embarrassed that she's not a little virgin dog anymore? I mean, she can't go to church anymore. <laughs> I think he's just so mortified because he takes it so personal. He, oh. he views it as an utter failure. Well, he's clearly a bad dog owner. He's, he's a bad dog owner. And I'll tell you what's even more bizarre is... If you're listening at home, you're thinking, why in God's name does Kevin know so much about the mating <laughs> habits of a dog? To which I would say, we bred our Springer Spaniel when I was growing up only once. And I don't think you or dad like knew what was happening necessarily either. But you explained to me along the way when I said, why are they stuck together? You're like, well, this is the process of what happens when the dogs mate. Fast forward two months because the not the digestion, Gestate. the gesta gestation, the gestation period, <laughs> not the digestion, the gestation yeah. period of a dog is like two months, a little over two months. You and dad were gone. You were on like a business trip. Right. I remember that. And this was in the summer. So it was a babysitter and I coming home from karate. I'm a black belt. <laughs> not a big deal. Black belt. Oh my God. I think the, we couldn't, I don't remember why. Blossom would have been outside, but... No, I think that's where she went. But I don't know why we would have left her outside. You probably just put her out. She had the most beautiful dog house that we could never convince Dad her Dad built it, to. right? Yes, it was fabulous. So we left her outside, and I think we went outside to grab her. And she comes up, and she's just like panting, and she's wet from sweat, and she's bleeding everywhere. Horrified. I am Horrified. I think my childhood best friend is dying in front of me. I forget that, oh, she's probably having puppies, which is what she did. She went back into her doghouse that she never used. Would never use. Proceeded to pop out four little puppers. I think in my full karate gi, I sprinted <laughs> down to the vet who lived three doors down. He came over like super duper nonchalant and he goes, well, she's got puppies. She did a good job. So... The fact that my knowledge of dog mating would come in handy 26 <laughs> years later still surprised me to this day. I feel awful for Chris. I feel horrible for the dog. He thought he could leave him alone for just a, a short amount of time and nothing bad would happen. I also think he, he applied some human dynamic to it, which is, hey, even though my dog might be in heat, her brother wouldn't possibly find her attractive, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> and instead, oh my God, he bared witness to incest, of which 
<laughs> she was supposed to get spayed, I guess, in a couple weeks, and hopefully oh. she can still get spayed and it doesn't turn into an ultrasound thing. Yeah. Well, no, that could happen. Yeah, that really went sideways, didn't it, for them? Well, it really went reverse more than anything else. <laughs> it was it was quite a bit mm. of humor, to say the least, over Froyo. Here's the thing. That poor dog, after all of that, she did not want to get drugged to Froyo. I can assure you that. No, she probably just wanted to bath and yeah. to listen to some Janelle Monet and just be in her feelings. And put me away from that other dog, right? My brother. <laughs> 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 it's oh, no. it's all made worse because it doesn't i mean listen they're just animals who cares they're 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 beasts but the fact that you can refer to them <laughs> as brother and sister makes the story that much worse so if they have little puppies will it be like uncle daddy what will it be i think he just put the puppies into a box and put them in the Truckee river and just oh, no. moses them don't even say that no 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 take it back the genetic Almost defaults in those back. dogs no 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 Deb, no, we've no, all seen no, West no, Virginia, stop, Alabama stuff. Stop. It's not good. You just mentioned two states. Stop it. We know about that kind of stuff. <laughs> oh it God. does not end well for the next generation. To all the uh, inhabitants of West Virginia and Alabama. Yeah, as long as apologize. you don't marry your family, you're fine. I'm not talking oh. to you. I'm talking to our core audience members that marries their family. They understand <laughs> what I'm talking about here. Yeah, we just lost listeners for sure. If anything... We gained some listeners by talking about the very controversial incest. Of dogs. Of dogs. Yeah. So that's my story. Did you like it? <laughs> uh, you know, I I feel really bad for Chris. Okay. You know, he, So bad for Chris. He should be ashamed of himself, though, yeah. that he didn't educate himself a little better. Understanding right? the heat because that his, his dog was going into. His ignorance has caused him to be a neglectful owner, right? Potential and then g- I grandfather. Say, I'm kind of mad at the the brother's dad too. Yeah. I mean, like, where's that taught that guy? I, I, he might not even know, to be honest with you. It's been it might be a week, and he still has no idea about it. So then we could just have a whole thing on who should own a dog. Should they take a test? I mean, yeah, yeah for yeah, real. Right. This is why I don't have dogs or kids. Yeah. Because I don't. I can't. That's too much responsibility. It is. That's a lot to ask of it's me. A lot to monitor my dog cycles, so as to avoid this. <laughs> You know, I've cringed like 10 times during this. We're only talking about dogs, Deb. Okay. All right. Hard pivot. Deb, business segment, right? (laughs) I have no business segment. I can't do anything We're just going to keep talking about animals. So tell me a little bit about, as I gather my composure and we turn this back into a professional podcast. Yes. Tell me why you have such an issue with the cliche or the phrase or the saying known as... That's just business. So last Thursday, yes. do you remember what the exact question was? I honestly you think me? it was what saying or cliche do you believe is total BS? Mine was multitasking because nobody right. can actually multitask. And yours was, I hate when people say it's just business. It's not. So I was, as that came out of my mouth so fast, I think when you said it, yep. I didn't even really think, and it was almost like news to me, yep. which then makes me feel like that's really true, right? I mean, like it's just so, the answer's so spontaneous. Because right? it's ingrained in you to dislike it. deeply seated in there somewhere. Fair. So I think, um, so I started thinking, like, why does that bug you so much? And I think for me personally, I've just seen enough people just shove so many bad decisions and I'm just going to say bad behavior under it's just business. It's nothing personal, you know, that kind of thing and really have no other explanation. Do you feel it's, it's a, it's a way for somebody to say, not my problem. Uh, not my problem and not my responsibility. Yeah. When in fact it was all their responsibility. Cause you're the boss. Well, yeah, you're the one doing it. If you're the one in charge of this conversation, letting somebody go, you're the boss. So yes, it is your responsibility. Right. Or if you're going to demote somebody or you're going to change something that's going to drama- dramatically affect somebody's career or opportunity, it's, it's, it is, it's, it is personal. It's yep. personally going to affect them. The other part that when I started thinking about it, I was like, you know, who said that? Like, did Gordon Gecko say that? <laughs> you, know uh, you wanted an origin story. I wanted on this. an origin story. Like, 
I feel confident that it wasn't Warren Buffett, right? I mean, like, no. I'm kind of going, and I'm kind of doing, like, good guys, bad guys in my head. It does right? sound very 70s, 80s, Wall Street, slick hair, Gordon yes. Gecko. But it could have been Leonardo DiCaprio. Who was he? Jordan Belfort. Yeah, Wolf it could of have Wall been Street. him too, right? Gr- greed is good. Greed is good. All of that kind of thing. Yeah. So I'm thinking that it's something like that, right? And honestly, I'm thinking, like, probably Gordon Gecko. Was that... Uh, Michael Douglas Douglas yep. yeah and um, so I do a little googling Google machine look it up I will say that's a tagline that they used for the show The Apprentice a lot okay Point explains a lot however there is a person who kind of created this little thing this little saying okay his name was Otto Berman sounds very German does sound very German. Which the Germans are very businesslike. Well, he's the man that coined the phrase, it's just business. It's not personal. It's just business, Hassan Pfeffer. Otto was an accountant. Oh, boring. For the mob. Ooh, less boring. <laughs> cool. So. Not cool. I take that. I rescind my cool comment. Yeah. So he was the one that in the 30s, he would go out and um, he was an accountant for the mob. So he was in charge of collecting money. Right. Yep. Protection money. You For know, sure. so all the little shops or whatever, you know. And so as he goes out each month to get the money, if everything was fine, he collected the money and went on his way. If everything wasn't fine, then there was some kind of, I don't know, knee breaking, yeah. you know, knee capping, horse head. We got yeah, it. We seen I mean, the Godfather. You know, depending on how whoever had misstepped and how much, yep. right? And he was the one that would always say, It's just business, not personal. And so that's where it came from. So it came, didn't come from some like cool, high flying exec or some, you know, really interesting, successful entrepreneur. Or even a witty, uh, witty piece of dialogue or a really nice lyric. Nope. It was brought on by a corrupt German mafioso accountant to explain away hurting people. To explain away physically hurting people. Okay. Okay. So now that I know that, I hate it even more. Of course. Right? Because we, if there's one thing this podcast does not stand for, it's organized crime. (laughs) Right. Okay. We don't go for that. At all. So what I think is what happens with this so often is it's really not about business. I mean, we are people and we take our personal selves to our business places, right? Yep. Who I am goes with me everywhere. That is my person. It is personal. If I go to work and it's my birthday, the other persons around celebrate my my birthday, right? Correct. I mean, we celebrate people getting married at work. We celebrate people having babies at work. We celebrate promotions, which feel kind of personal and kind of professional. We take team photos. We take team photos. We give group bonuses when everybody works well together. We somehow sometimes have softball games. Oh, yeah. So there is a whole bunch of, in the world today, business and personal mixed in. Totally. Now, if we were talking about a situation where a company was really financially in so much trouble that it was unbelievable, I mean, it was going to fail. Mm -hmm. And the only way to save the majority of the company was to sacrifice part of it. I mean, an arm of it, if you will, right? And people are going to lose those jobs. First of all, those people have done nothing wrong. Do you know what I mean? I mean, it's just, this is just an extraordinary circumstance that ha- extraordinary measures have to be taken to fix the problem. Sure. And it's a built-in excuse. No, no, no. I'm saying if that's real. Like no, no. But I'm saying it's a built-in excuse to have to let people go because you have to keep this business alive. So right. you have to get rid of 10 to 15% of your staff. So if you say to each of those people, and in this case, who have really done nothing wrong, right? Yep. Hey, it's just business, nothing personal. I mean, I fe- think that that is so horrendous, right? And if it were me, I would want to say, like, listen, this is killing me. I mean, this is one of the most painful decisions we've ever had to make. I don't take it lightly, and I know whatever I'm feeling, it's a 100 times worse for you. Here's what we've done. Here's the package we could put together. Here's the resources we've given you. I mean, we are available to... 
uh, give you letters of recommendation. We're, you know what I mean? Like you try to make it as good as possible because here's the deal. They go, the door closes. Eventually you don't think of them anymore, but you're, you got to go on and still build the thing or sure. continue building the thing. It's almost your job to usher them out in the same way that you brought them in, which is catering to them. Well, so, you know, one of the things, and you've heard me say this a lot of time. So if I'm interviewing somebody and one of the things about me is I don't yell and scream at work, right? And it, I've always, because I've had those kind of bosses. She only does it at home. I only do it at home. But I, because I've had those kinds of bosses, it's really been a thing that I committed myself to. Totally. That I'll stay in this voice. And so if I'm talking to somebody, and I've seen this happen where People have been raised in a home or they live in a home where there's like a lot of shouting and people don't take each other seriously until they raise their voices. And so I say, I give people a warning. I say, listen, I'm going to hire you in this voice. I'm going to train you in this voice. I'm going to pat you on the back with this voice, right? I'm going to correct you with this voice. But if it doesn't work out, I'm also going to fire you with this voice. So you need to listen to what I say. Pay attention to my words. And I've, you know, that's what I do. But here's the thing. I really try to make it when I invite somebody into a business to work for me, I've given them this kind of space of grace to come in, if you will. I want to provide the same space of grace for them to leave, especially, I mean, if they haven't stolen or done something like that. So even if we say that there's somebody that deserves to be fired, right? They, um, I mean, they're just not equipped to do this job. Right. I mean, they're, their capabilities aren't there. I mean, I still think you don't have to say things like it's not personal. It's just business. You know, I think what you say, you you explain why the fit isn't right. You explain that, you know, you think there's a better opportunity out there for them. Right. And I think, you know, it's not working out anymore. We wish you the very best and that you do it that way. It sounds like what you're saying is you owe the person an an educational component, meaning if there's layoffs that are affecting multiple people, everybody deserves to know that your work, your effort has nothing to do with this. It's just the short end of the stick. And we looked where we could trim overlaps or deemed unnecessary. And with the biggest regret in the world that that's you, or if somebody is being terminated for cause, you owe them the explanation as to why they're leaving. And it should come from an authentic place so that person hopefully can learn from it, better themselves, and their next job will allow for them to be more conscious and mindful of what they're trying to accomplish. And the truth of the matter is, firing somebody is a difficult conversation. Totally. It's horrible. It's uncomfortable. If you are a decent human being, you lose lose sleep over it. You get sick to your stomach. You feel like you want to throw up. I mean, because you know you're impacting someone's life in a very negative way, right? And so to say quippy things at that time, like, I mean, it's just business. It's not personal, right? It's just rubbing salt in a wound is what I think. Even George Clooney and Anna Kendrick in the movie Up in the Air (laughs) did not say it's just business. And their job was to go into companies and lay off swaths of people. And they even tried to make it feel better for them, giving them a new opportunity on life, allowing them to pursue new careers. If those people whose job it is to fire people who don't know these people and can be as cold and calculated as possible, even though they're fictitious... If you're a business owner, you need to approach it more with kid gloves than anything else. Right. And I think one of the things, especially, I mean, you know, large corporations have legal departments and HR departments and everything. I think small business owners usually let people overstay because they just have a soft heart, if you will. Sure. But small business owners, too, my experience is get very worried about people suing or there being some kind of dust up kickback thing that's going to happen to them. Right. Yeah. And I, I th- that was going to be one of my other questions is, do you think half the time somebody says it's just business and kind of ends the conversation there is because they're trying to protect themselves from any 
legal ramifications. I mean, that that I could see that being very easily kind of excused away as to say, well, I don't want to have emotion to it. I don't want to speak too much. I just want to get to brass tacks and let them know that you're being let go simply because it's just business. It's not because of your performance. Here's your severance. Well, I think you in that case, you'd be much wiser to say because of their performance, which hopefully this is not a first conversation you've tracked, right? Sure. And had several conversations. But when, so look at me and say, it's it's not business. I mean, it is, you know what I mean? It's just business. It's not personal. Deb. Yeah. I'm so sorry to bring you in here today. Yeah. But we're letting you go. Oh. It's just business, baby. <laughs> so at that point, what I want to say is it's all personal. And you've made it all personal. We've had personal chats in here. We've had personal parties in here. I mean, all the things you and I talked about before. I've seen you uh, angry in here. I've seen you happy in here. I've seen, I've seen you celebrate in here. I've seen you disappointed and sad in here. I've seen you frustrated in here. I've met your wife. I've met your kids. Yeah, you've met I mean, my husband. Exactly. It's a thing, right? And so, like, don't shove that under the rug because you're uncomfortable with the real conversation that should be had. And don't send somebody out the door confused because you didn't say the right words or because you are trying to climb a, climb a corporate ladder or because you're trying to be some cool entrepreneur, right? And that's more important. And you're looking for that, I'm going to say salve or bomb that makes you feel okay. But the truth of the matter is, that's not normally the truth, right? I mean, totally. the truth is something else. And I think that's the part, everybody knows the truth is something else, but they just, you know, the person delivering the message won't say what it is. I think we've mentioned this on the podcast before, but you of course were in charge of hiring and firing many people when you owned the restaurant and you were so tactful with the way that you fired people that at one point, everybody thought you had fired somebody so softly that they didn't actually know that they were fired and people were anticipating the person coming back to work the very next day. So I remember the girl where that happened and I just, what I thought was that she was just going to melt and fall apart. And so I was just really, really careful with my language and very soft with it. And I made a point of telling her the things that I thought she did well. Yep. And then, of course, I told her where the problems were and where we had talked about them time and time and time again. And so I think it was time for us to part company, but I really want the best for her. She didn't fall apart at all. I mean, she was like lovely. Which I think was why everybody was worried. <laughs> Which was like, I mean, she, it's not like she had her head down and, you know, was looking to get out of there fast or anything like that. I mean, and I mean, at one point I wondered like, did she miss the point? Did I not right. say it? But she didn't come in the next day. She we did not safe. pull a George Costanza. Yeah, we were safe. Show up the next day. But I think I just, I don't know. I feel like it's, and now that I know its origin, I'm going to stick to it. Otto Berman. I think it's a bad thing. I'm I just agree. Gonna say that. As business owners, do not rely on something that the mafiosos used to say. Exactly. If your go-to is something somebody said before they whacked somebody, remove that from your lexicon. That's not good. I agree. You're small business owners. You're not an organized crime syndicate. Right. I think. And I do think there's that thing where when someone has been with you, and even though you might be frustrated with their performance, right? I'm Again, we're not talking about people that are stealing or anything like that but you're frustrated with their performance or there's an arm of your business that financially isn't performing, isn't successful. So you're going to eliminate it. I'm just saying like, don't say words where these people have to feel extra guilty or some kind of inordinate shame because you're uncomfortable having the conversation that you should actually be having. You're not responsible for their feelings, but you are responsible for how you approach the conversation. I agree. Yes. That's fair. We don't ever want to hear anybody say that ever again. So we don't. So we're on a, a little march here. This is our little crusade. This is our personal crusade. Our personal crusade. I'm going to take issue with people if they say it in front of me. 
Is that good? Yes, because I'm I'm now. now offended if it's said in my <laughs> no, area. But you know what I am going to say. Have you ever heard of Otto Berman? Oh yeah. Let me tell you about him. Bad dude. 1930s accountant for the mafia. And he was German. <laughs> we don't know he was German. Fair. Okay. But he doesn't sound Italian. I'll give you no. That. His <laughs> name's Autobahn or something. That's like from Germany. Okay. Deborah. Yes. Let's just keep segueing to new segments. Okay. You're kind of on a little. I, I, listen, I'm excited. We're talking about NASA. We're talking about docs. We're talking about Otto Van Buren. <laughs> We're talking about dear Debbie. Okay. Three brand new questions, two business related, one fun. Okay. Numero uno. Dear Debbie, I have a pet peeve, and it's an aggravation I encounter frequently. Mm. For some reason, people do not understand hours of business. Our hours are always clearly posted, so please don't knock on the door before the business is open. My personal irritant has to be with closing time. When the sign says we close at 9 p.m., it means the doors lock at 9 p.m., it does not mean that if you can slide in the door 30 seconds before closing that we must stay and serve your needs for however long you are present. If you can't complete your business at out, at or before closing time, then come back tomorrow and find a business that stays open later. There are still a lot of duties to be finished after the last customer leaves and before we can go home. This person needs to quit their restaurant job. Is it a restaurant? I mean, it doesn't say so, but like clearly this person serves food. This, I mean, well, first that person is like annoying as heck, right? Of, We just got done speaking about owning a restaurant. If you are going to find yourself in the world of customer service, yes, this is your biggest issue. It's par for the course. It's going to happen more often than it doesn't. And for you to take this like as a personal offense, like this is some spotlight on the decay of society like <laughs> welcome to slinging burgers dude so let's do this this will actually be fun i'm going to speak as if i'm the owner fair you speak as if you're the employee yeah no okay. I, I So let's have the conversation let me say way. this first when i worked in restaurants this was me i <laughs> fully appreciate where this person's coming from but what you don't do is you don't really vocalize it and you don't try to change it so when we owned the restaurant, we were not open for dinner and we had a lot of events in the evening, but that, but we weren't open for dinner, dinner. And so, um, we, I think we closed at four. Yeah. Four or three, something like that. But people were scheduled for like, I don't know, half an hour, an hour afterwards. Yeah. So if somebody slid in the door at four before four, we helped them. I mean, that was our deal. Or because it's daylight and if they still see three or four employees inside, they knock on the door. We don't just like turn around yeah. and not pay attention to the noise coming from the front and door. And I had a rule like you do not run over and lock that door at that moment because people- Ownership. Do, because that's an owner. That's my point. Um, and because what do I want? Money. Exactly. <laughs> and I want to be a good customer service, you know, business owner. And they're right there. Is the difference. Is the difference, yeah. which is that person coming in two minutes before you're open or 30 seconds after you're closed. Yeah. Yeah. That person is no longer on their professional time. They're on their personal time. Sadly, it's overlapping with your professional time when you're trying to go on your personal time. Of course, every single employee who works in a restaurant wants to work their hard hours from nine to five or from noon to 10. That's what they want to work. Right. That's not what that industry is set up for. No. And you're going to, your, the owner is going to take the business wherever they can get the business and it's your job to do it. And that's why it sucks if you've let it reach this point. If you've yeah. let it reach this point where you're like writing letters about how miserable you are, you yeah. have to go find a new profession. You do. Have I to. I think we did a really good job. I think, you know, um, if, if somebody would have come in, I'm going to say like at 345 mm -hmm. and really not just ordered a coffee or something, but really ordered a meal, we probably would have said, hey, come on, we've got you. And then we would say, we close at four, but you're free to stay. I mean, we would have said that to him this is just what, to give him a heads this up. This is what I would say. I say, hey, we technically close at four. 
you can stay as long as we're still cleaning up. At the point that we're done cleaning, we're going to ask you to go. Nobody had a problem with that. Nobody ever had a problem. And then what we did is we were very good about what I want to say is kind of the soft or quiet cleaning. We did all that first. Just And we tended to them still, yep. you know, whatever they needed. And then at the point that it really like, okay, we've got to put tables on chairs or yeah. whatever. And But people since that, 90% of the time, they would have said, hey, we're getting out of here. I mean, they figured it out, right? Or I would just put on the Marshall Mathers LP and start blaring it. <laughs> yeah, or that. Um, but I, I just think like, I, I want to be the owner that like when that guy drives by and it's 15 minutes early, the open sign isn't there, but he sees the people in sure. there and says... I mean, hey, can I get a cup of coffee or the scones out of the oven? You want to go? Yeah. I, I'm with you and I completely sympathize. But let me tell you this. Even <laughs> if somebody walks in at 4.59 a.m. and 52 seconds, you hate that person. The second it hits five o'clock, you're like, hey, what's up, man? Good yeah. to see you. Yeah. It's, just, it's just the difference between ownership and employees. Yeah. Question number two. Dear Debbie, I co-own. Oh, this is a good one. I co-own a professional service business with a woman whose appearance has deteriorated significantly over the last three or four years. Oh, there's a fake name. Mary (laughs) was never a fashion plate. Yeah, a fashion plate is a thing. That's old. That's an older term. A little, Mary was never a fashionista. Was never fashionable. Okay. But she used to be pre- <laughs> but she used to be presentable for business. Mm. Four years ago, she put on quite a bit of weight. She refuses to buy new clothes until she loses it, but she makes no real attempt to do so. Totally understand that. Mary wears the same three pairs of baggy pants to the office day after day. She does have two good outfits, finger quotes, good outfits she will wear to see clients, but even those are threadbare. I dread the idea of a client dropping in and seeing Mary in her normal state, especially, especially since she takes her shoes off at the office because her feet swell, oh, no. <laughs> swell, not smell, swell. Oh. She has become an embarrassment. How do you think I should handle this? I honestly think of every question we've ever had, this might be every single person's nightmare. I, I want to say that appearance especially when it's been acceptable and then, you know, gone downhill. Appearance and hygiene are the two worst things in the world to talk about. And if you have to talk to somebody of the opposite sex about it, it is the worst thing in the world. I mean, it's just awful. I knew a guy who, I knew he showered. I knew it. He could not have not showered. He was just like, it's not like he was like 16 and thought, his hygiene didn't suck yet. He was like older and he was the worst smelling human being in the world. And I honestly remember thinking I have to suffer by being around him, but thank God I never have to address it. Oh, I know. So this is really tough because they're business owners together, right? Is they that are co-owners. Okay. So they're co-owners. Of a professional service business. So the truth of the matter is, you know, nobody has any authority over anybody. True. I mean, Equals. they're just co-owners. Probably what I would do is, you know, I don't know, go for a coffee, go for a walk or something like that. Definitely go for a walk, given <laughs> what was just written. And I want to say right up front, I'm not talking about her weight. I would not do that. Right. I mean, if she brings it up, we can talk about it, but I would not bring it up. Right. And probably what I'd say is, you know, Mary, we are owners of a professional service, you know, business in our industry this is kind of how people would dress, you know, and kind of give the spectrum of that, right? Yep. And I know that you're a little frustrated, you know, where you are with clothes, because she would have said that with her weight, and say, but listen, like, you just need to get some new clothes. You'll look great. I mean, I would encourage her, right? Like, do we need to get a new haircut? Do we need to, you know, and I would probably at that point even say, you know, let's let the business buy some of this stuff for you. Do you know what I mean? And if she said, well, no, but I want to lose weight. And I would say, no, you can lose weight. I mean, that's up to you. That's not what I'm talking about today. Today, I'm talking about you representing our business in the most professional sense every day. And that's not happening. There's been a lot of slippage and people do make right or wrong 
people make assessments and judgments and sometimes value our service based on our first impression. And whether or not we wear shoes. And your feet smell. No. <laughs> but um, Swell. I mean, I just think like that is, it, that is hard. That is such a difficult thing. I, it might be everybody's nightmare. Well, and then it too, when you know, when you just described this woman and all of that, you know, I think sometimes with some people, there's, you know, they gain a few pounds or life deals them a dirty hand, you know, something happens and they just kind of fall into a depression and they don't care. Yep. And then it's like, it really isn't about her clothes anymore. Do you know what I mean? I mean, sure. it's a much deeper issue. I mean, this clearly goes beyond, she just stopped caring about her appearance. There are right. a ton of emotional issues at play here. Again, which I think subconsciously we all realize it's one thing if you go up to somebody and be like, Hey man, your attire has just been deplorable. I right. know that what you're capable of. All of this is symptomatic of something far bigger that you as the co-owner can certainly address, but then she honestly probably needs some like professional help with. Right. So I do think here's the, I do want to say this. I think every business, whether you wear uniforms, whether you're medical and you wear scrubs, whether it's business attire, whatever it is, there should be a dress code for every business, large and small. Yep. And if this if they had a dress code and if it were written down, then the one thing you get to fall back on is we are the owners. We established this dress code. We've got to be the example and we've got to abide by it. Weaponize the ownership. So, you know, having those kinds of things in place end up helping you with that kind of thing too. And I know that I have started including when I've helped people do um, like an employee handbook, I actually put something about hygiene in there. Oh. Yeah. And it's just the fact that that hygiene word is in there doesn't make it nice, but it makes it a titch easier to have to talk about if you have to talk about it. What if you were colonizing Mars and somebody had bad hygiene? Wouldn't that be bad under a biodome? Staying on Earth. Yeah. Dear Debbie, during a recent family dinner, my uncle presented an odd gift to everyone there. He's in his mid-50s and involved in the community and government of a small town. He and other public figures, most of them older, decided to publish a calendar. Oh, that's sweet. Oh, cute. On each page, there is a nude photo. <laughs> okay of an aging community luminary posing with strategically placed objects covering his or her goods. Interesting. To say the least, the photos are not flattering, funny, or particularly modest. I hope she's not body shaming. Not only did my uncle- I'll bet they're funny. <laughs> not only did my <laughs> uncle give one to every family member, including my 80-year-old grandparents, he took pains to point out his photo. The awkward silence that followed ruined an otherwise nice family dinner. Did the gift cross the line? Is there a rule of etiquette regarding risque pictures of oneself? And how do I make sure I never have to see any other <laughs> family members in their birthday suits without my oh consent? My God. Dear Uptight. Yeah, so that's a little bit reactionary. I mean, how often are, are family members giving you unsolicited well, risque pics? Go find a new family if there's more than one. Find a new family. And then I'm more offended that they were given a paper calendar than anything. Yeah. You know I mean? I I'd look at, let's just call him Uncle Rico. And I'd be like, <laughs> Uncle Rico, what do you want me to do with this? I mean, do you expect me to get a thumbtack and put it on my wall? Yeah. No. The answer is no. So I think that maybe a bit misguided these people, these luminaries in their little town decided. Great word, luminaries. Thought this would be, I've got to believe they thought it would be hysterical. I believe they're probably doing it for some fundraiser. Exactly. And, and they're like, you know what's great? We're old. Yeah. We're a little saggier in places. This is going to help yeah. ingratiate us to the community. But wait a minute. I just want to say this. George Clooney's in his 50s. And he is <laughs> good know? looking. So, but my point being is, it possibly ended up being a little misguided, right? But it was, you you know, it was done for some bigger purpose. Of course. Like they were, you know, the volunteer fire department. It's not like they're a nudist calling. They're yeah. like, hey, come buy our calendars. And I'm sort of like, I mean, well, first of all, I think if it would have happened, if we take like my side of the family, yeah. I think everybody would have laughed for sure. Don't you? There would have been a chuckle. I'm not saying that, I'm not saying that handing these out at a family function wouldn't elicit some like dead eye stares. Well, I hope you're not. First of all, I hope you're not 
handing it out to the children under 10. Agreed. And then I hope you're, or whatever the right age would be. 18. And, okay, 18. <laughs> and then I, you know, I mean, I do want to say, you know, there are 80-year-old people. I mean, Isabel would have laughed at this stuff. Of course. She I, was 96. I also think you you owe an explanation of, this guy seems awesome. Yeah. Like he's willing yeah. to get in his skivvies and have pictures taken of him. And then he's proud of it. And he's handing it out to the family. And he's got a big top hat and a strategic spot. Yeah, this yeah. is no different than the, like the uncle or the brother who gave whoopee cushions as a gift. Oh, yeah, that yeah. dude's Same guy. great. Yeah. Here's the problem. You, you're yeah. the problem. Yeah. What you say is, hey, Uncle Rico, this is weird. Thanks so much. You go home, you burn it, and then you <laughs> never have to think about it ever again. Exactly. I mean, first of all, his thing about how can I insure? And I'm like, unless there's something weird... That we don't know about your Again, family. Again, like, are you so worried about your family sending you risque nude <laughs> photos that you are like, you can count it on more than one hand? Right, right. Because I mean, then was, leave the family. Yeah. And if, if it is, I mean, you know, the only thing I can think about is if this family is just so seriously conservative. Yeah. And Uncle Rico is out there, you know, just kind of a wild card in the family. No, I hope so. Then he doesn't care. I no, mean, he doesn't care. And we're not going to change him because no. he's probably been doing it his whole life. And what he really doesn't care about is your emotions because he's got a bunch of middle-aged 50 year old guys who are poking fun of him at the golf course. And guess what? He made it on the calendar. Yeah. Yeah. You didn't. <laughs> Deborah. Yes. What's for dinner tonight? Oh, muscles. I didn't go to the gym today. Muscles are okay. Oh, it was more of a workout. It's more of a workout thing. Oh, okay. You weren't relating it to the muscles. It's more of a it was more of a workout joke. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. So, our Costco in Reno, Nevada, periodically gets muscles in fresh muscles, and they are from Penn Cove on Whidbey Island in the state of Washington which is when we lived in Seattle where we would have gotten them from anyways. Got it. So that always feels good to me when we get them in here. And, you know, we'll do like a little, you know, some garlic, onions, herbs, a little white wine, maybe a little splash of cream. That all sounds yeah. phenomenal to me. I just find it odd that even though we're a bunch of Pacific Northwesterners, is that right? Pacific yeah, Northwesterners, we, we don't really eat seafood. Yes, like we, we do. We eat salmon. Yes. Sometimes we'll buy cod. Yes. We were on a bit of a shrimp kick this summer. Yes. But for the majority of the time, it's landlocked proteins that we eat. Well, here's the thing. I think, number one, you know, we were a little bit, years and years ago when we first moved here, we were kind of those people like, where did that fish come from? I mean, maybe not what tributary, but what river, right? You little know? Portlandia. And how was it caught? You know, we were kind of those people. Yeah. We definitely don't eat farm-raised fish. We don't eat farm-raised fish. We're and we will that. die on that hill. And, you know, we're pretty we're pretty much wild caught, that kind of thing. Do you know what I mean? I mean, we, we like to eat the way we live, wild. <laughs> so, uh, but, I mean, I don't know. We're, we live in like good ranching country, right? I mean, that's yes. where we live. But um, anyways, so we'll have the mussels tonight with the little grilled ciabatta or something. Gluten-free ciabatta. Gluten-free ciabatta. Love it. That sounds delicious. And the way that thing smells when you're cooking it up, oh, yeah, beautiful. It's good. As we wind it down, Deborah, this week, what are you thankful for? I got the second COVID shot. Yes, you did. That's yeah. right. So I'm really, really grateful for it. Where we went here in our community was, it's an area called the Livestock Event Center. Speaking of cattle. And you just go like wind through this parking lot. Yep. It is unbelievably perfectly well organized. It is like an orchestra. It is amazing. They've got the National Guard, then lots of volunteers, and then health department people there. Yeah. And so my first shot I got, the gal, you know, said, hey, could you open your car door? I did. She leaned in. She gave me the shot. And she said, hey, tell your friends you got the shot at the Livestock Event Center from a big animal vet. And I looked at her. I said, are you really a vet? And she said, yes. So I didn't have any issues the first time. Right. right? You took a Tylenol. I t took a Tylenol before, but I found out you're supposed to actually wait and take it. So I waited the second time. Got it. But. 
Don't take a Tylenol. My arm never, I couldn't even feel. Like I didn't, some people say they can't even lift their arm up. It hurts. I had no problems at all. So the second time I'm going through, and I will tell you the same beautiful, orchestrated, easy thing. And this girl is uh, checking with me right before I'm going to be the next car for the shot. And I said, you know, the last time she's, oh, she asked me, what were your side effects? I said, really none. She goes, I've only heard that from a couple people wow. Good for you. And so I said, oh, it's probably because a vet gave me the shot, you know, like kind of being lighthearted. And she said, I'm a vet. And I said, then I want you to give me the shot. And she goes, oh, I'm not doing shots right now. Stay here. So she goes and runs into the little cubicle thing. And this tall guy comes out and he goes, I heard you asked for me. And I'm like, hey, Jason, you know, no. And he said, I'm a vet. And I went, oh, yes, yes. And he's, I said, yes, you're a vet. I want a, my shot from a vet today. And he goes, okay. So he went and got the shot. And he said, uh, why the vet? And I told him the story. And he actually knew the other woman. Oh, wow, funny. Both from Colorado here giving shots. So shout out to the state of Colorado for loaning us vets. Thanks for sending us your animal doctors. Exactly. And he gave me a shot and I want to say I have no, like it is like I didn't even get a shot in that arm. My arm is perfectly fine. I felt that night I didn't get a lot of sleep and we've been under a little stress. And so, and I was up really late and then up again with that. So I didn't really, I want to say I didn't feel amazing. Yep. I did get a bad headache. I don't know if it was from the shot. I feel like it might've been maybe, I don't know. But overall, nothing, nothing that I couldn't, if I hadn't have gotten the shot and had those same feelings, I would have said I was fine. So look out America. Debsy is fully vaccinated and coming fully to vaccinated. a city near it's you. It's true. It's true. Debsy tour 2021 <laughs> hitting you up. Yeah. Uh, my thankful will be very brief. Um, you touched on it really early. Uh, really, you touched on it earlier which is there are things that our family is going through, which people know. There are things that we are going through that people won't know. At some point, we will talk about that. This is not the time or the venue for that. But I want to say thank you for every single person in our life who has reached out, whether knowing this or not knowing this. You have been such a groundswell of support for us, for, for you as an individual, for me as an individual, and for dad as an individual. We do this podcast because we love it the love and appreciation that we get from this tickles us pink. The love and appreciation we get that goes beyond this is unlike anything that I would have ever experienced. So when we have our moments of being down or we have our moments of woe is me, people just show up in the most beautiful karmic way that I know they have no idea about. And it's a constant reminder that even in the bad times, even in the dark times, if you're looking for it, if you're willing to search for it, you can find the good stuff. And it's that good stuff that's going to buoy you through all the crap that life will throw at you. So the list is way too long to thank everybody, but I promise you, if you've reached out in any capacity in the last month, you are on this, this list. And we, listen, I mean, people say to us all the time, you're in our thoughts and prayers. We're thinking good thoughts for you and all that. And I don't take any of that lightly. I literally picture people, you know, praying for us and that comforts me and yep. lifts my heart. But I have to say we are wealthy in the kindness, the love, the support, and the friendship that has been shown to us. The only thing we're wealthier in is podcast dollars. That's not true, Kevin. Fair. So, like, <laughs> review, what do you say at the end? That's going to do it for this <laughs> Monday episode of the Devin Kev podcast. Remember to like, rate, and review wherever you listen to this podcast. Make sure to follow us on all of our social channels at Deb and Kev Pod. And you can watch this episode on Tuesday on our YouTube channel. Deb, is there anything else you think we haven't covered on this episode? This was a very odd assortment of topics. Spoiler alert. <laughs> we already recorded this episode. Oh. We didn't want to mention it at the front of the, the show. We recorded this episode. It was hilarious. I would argue that just 
without anybody having heard it. It was one of the funnier shows that we had done. It was, I left the desk in such a happy mood. Agreed. Because I thought it was, I mean, just, it was just the energy was perfect. Yep. And I turned off the mics and I was going to start editing it and I pushed play and it, we sounded like how Daft Punk looks. We sounded like our eventual robot overlords. It was awful. I felt so sick to my stomach. But here we are. Doing I think again. we did it even better the second time around. Yeah. We've only had that happen once before, and that was a hardware issue, and this was just a glitch in the mixer. Yeah. So we've done this twice. We're professionals in this particular podcast, this particular episode. So we hope you all liked it. Oh, I do think we were a little bit more committed to our opinions in the second round. For <laughs> sure. And it took a lot of music to get our energy levels yeah. back up to yeah. where they were. There was a little cheering involved. Oh my gosh, so much so. Mom, I love you to death. I love you, baby. We'll see you guys on Thursday. Thank you for listening to the Deb and Kev podcast. Remember to like and subscribe wherever you listen to this podcast. Follow Deb and Kev on Facebook and on Instagram and Twitter at Deb and Kev Pod.